Hello and welcome everybody to today's Battery Day webinar. Uh, my name's Izzy and I am one of cohort four of the Faraday Institution PhD cohorts um, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Birmingham and I'm going to be your host for this webinar today. So while you wait, please introduce yourself, say hello in the chat box and there's also a Q&A box where you can stick questions throughout the webinar and we will um, answer them at the end. It's great to see so many of you joining today and we have some exciting speakers lined up for you. So we are recording this session so and you will be able to watch it later. So but please just be aware of that when you're asking questions as it will be shared widely. So um, you can find the Q&A box at the bottom there. So and before we get started, I'll just go through a few bits of housekeeping. So please do engage with the Q&A box to ask questions to the speakers and introduce yourself in the chat. There are no silly questions today and we have a wide range of backgrounds and knowledge levels in this call. So I will now introduce you, oh, sorry, so a couple of ground rules, be fully present, try and avoid distraction or multitasking to get the most out of this webinar. Engage, so introduce yourself in the chat box, um, question and answers, and respect others. All contributions are valued and protect your sensitive information because this webinar will be shared. So I'm going to introduce you to the Faraday Institution now. So it's the UK's independent institute for electrochemical energy storage research. We have over 500 researchers up and down the country, and we work with academics, people in industry and policymakers to make a better rechargeable batteries. Here and recently, so growth and interest, so leveling up all across the UK and diversity as well. Here are some of the metrics that we're looking at. So we'd like to reduce battery cost, weight and volume, all while improving battery performance and ensuring that batteries can be recycled and reused. So that's so that the battery industry is sustainable. So why are batteries actually important and why are we all here today? Batteries are used in several applications, from mobile phones to laptops to electric vehicles. The government has announced that the UK is aiming to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And so electrifying sectors such as transport is a really important step along the way. So new cars and vans powered wholly by petrol and diesel will not be sold in the UK from 2035 now. Battery research is important as in order to make these batteries sustainable and better, it for these electric vehicles so we can drive a longer amount of time without having to refill and that the lifetime of the battery itself is also longer. So research enables all of this. So onto batteries. So how does a battery work? So you might hear us mention some of these words today. So we have three key components to a battery and that is the anode, the cathode and the separator that keeps them apart. And I like to think of it like a seesaw. So we push, we start with our um, lithium ions, which are these red dots, and there are charge carriers, so they can move in between each one. Um, and we start with them in the cathode and we push them up the seesaw into the anode. And then when we want to use the battery, we can let them roll back down from the anode. So down the seesaw into the cathode and that lets the charge flow. And that means that we can use it on the go from wherever we are. The cathode material tends to look like this. So it will be rows of lithium ions in these blue and they can move in and out of these road um, layered structures. And then anode material tends to look like this. So the same layered structures. So we can think about it as layers with lithium ions moving in and out of the layers into each side. So if we think, so that's how a battery works, but then what does research actually look like in practice? So the first year of my PhD was centered around this type of research. So I'd start with a powder and I'd prepare it in a certain way. So using a certain mix that I wanted to try of different transition metal ions. And then I would fire it in a furnace at a hot temperature. And then I would use this material that I'd made and make it up into like a paint consistency and paint it on an aluminium. These were not very good ones, but they're cut from quite early on. Um, and then I would take this basically painting, which we call electrode, and punch it into circles and test it in a coin cell. Sorry. <laughs> and I've got a video here of that coating process. So you can just picture it a little bit in your head as to what it looks like. So this black slurry here is made out of um, this powder that I prepared from the furnace. 
and then I just coat it onto the aluminium powder like this, aluminium and foil like this. So my career so far, so as your host today, I'll be helping ask the questions, but I can also answer them. So this gives you a little bit of context. So um, I did a master in chemistry at the University of Oxford. And during that time, I did a lot of sport and I did a, a master's project completely different on batteries. And I did it on um, biodegradable polylactide synthesis. And so that's what you can see here. Um, so don't worry if you're not in batteries right now. It's OK. It's very transferable skills. And I did um, a fuse internships or a Faraday undergraduate student um, internship in summer 2019 at the end of my second year. Um, and I did it in the Oxford Materials Department on solid state batteries. So that's me in the picture in the background. And then in summer 2021, 20, I worked for Northvolt um, again on a summer internship. Um, just to get a feel of how um, a battery battery might work at a bigger scale. And I was in the quality control department, so you can see me here with a nickel liquid here. So being a PhD student looks like for me, so I'm in the CATMAP project now, and I work in the energy materials group in Birmingham. And for me, it looks like on a day-to-day -day research, so that's me with my green liquids here. I teach a lot, so that's me in the chemistry department. And then I also do a lot of science communication. So whether that be on Twitter or on blogs or even standing up and talking about my research, um, those are the three main parts of my PhD. So, which I, I really like the diversity and no day is the same. So we are now going to move on to hear one of our fabulous speakers. So first we have Callum from UCL and he is gonna talk to us a little bit about what he gets up to in his day to day. Thank you, Izzy, for that introduction. I uh, hope you can all see the um, starting slide. I think you can. Um, and yeah, as Izzy said, I'm uh, Callum. I'm a first year PhD researcher at UCL. And as you can see by the lovely logo at the bottom, and the fact I'm actually speaking to you today, my project is affiliated with the Faraday Institution. Um, as I'm relatively new to the PhD, so I'm only the first year, um, I'll only briefly touch on the PhD side of things. The main focus of what I'm here to tell you today about is is my background and, and what got me to the PhD. Um, so with that in mind, I'll just show you a little overview of, um, oh, I'll show you a little, is that, there you go, a little overview of the timeline over the last few years. Um, and basically what I'll be speaking about. Um, so I'll start with my time at Bristol. So that's where I did my undergrad degree and then my little, a, bit, a bit of the time after in Bristol. Um, and then I'll talk about my time at the Bristol-based battery startup, Anafite, um, and then what interested me about a career in the battery industry. Um, next, I'll move on to what brought me back into academia with my current PhD at UCL. And then I'll speak a little bit more about one of those specific drivers back into academia, which is the Faraday enrichment training I'm receiving. Um, and I'll tell you at the end about some of the amazing opportunities they've got. And then I'll finally finish off with um, any tips that I can give you guys as undergrads in your position. So uh, as I mentioned, I studied in Bristol from 2016 to 2020 um, uh, during my master's, it was in chemistry. And my final year project was nothing to do with batteries, really, or electrochemistry. In fact, I didn't really enjoy those lectures very much and tended to avoid, avoid them where possible. My final year project was actually working on, on organic uh, conducting polymer, such as polyaniline. So you can see the structure just on the left there. And it was for the application of wearable electronics. And to be honest, I didn't enjoy that final year project much either. Uh, don't get me wrong, there was a lot of areas of chemistry that I did enjoy but I just had the sense that I had quite found my niche or something to stick with. So because of that, I left university slightly unsure of what to do next, but having a sense that I wanted some experience outside the lab environment. Um, unfortunately for me, it was peak COVID season at the time. So I actually got a job in a COVID testing site. And I also tried my hand at a few other roles. So I was working as a data reviewer, as a sales coordinator. And although I knew those roles weren't my long-term career, um, I still gained very good experiences from them that um, I felt separated me from a usual scientist. Um, but during one of those roles, I was working in a incubator hub. So that's kind of a, um, a platform for startups, in this case, spe specifically scientific startups, 
um, to get going. And so it gives them office space and lab space. So the incubator hub I was working at had about 16 different companies. It was called Science Crates in Bristol. And um, while I was working in one of those, I was um, I made some friends who were in more technical roles. And through speaking to them about their interesting research, I realized I still had a desire to use my academic background. And through the connections I made there, I found a job as a technician at the battery-based startup Anafite. So a little bit about my time in the battery industry with Anafite. So if you look at the top left photo there, that's about the time I joined. I think there was around 10 people in the office when I arrived. And they recently just acquired the warehouse in which they stood. And then if you fast forward around 18 months later to that bottom right image, um, that was taken about the time I left with the warehouse now fully commissioned with a uh, fully walk-in dry room, um, walk-in fume hoods, and um, enough uh, materials and equipment to make batteries at pouch cell level, which is basically very large. Um, so during the time in between when I was working there, I learned a lot about the battery industry as a whole. I learned a lot about the science of batteries and had a lot of fun along the way. And I want to be able to sit here and and say that it was a very deliberate choice to join the battery industry and that I thought about my options beforehand. But to be honest, for me, it was just, it was a company that had a real world application. It was a chance to use my scientific thinking again. And I just got a really good feel for the company. And um, that time in between university and Anafite was, um, was, I was really grateful for that time basically, because it made me realize that I did want to use my scientific thinking again and actually use that background. And I just got lucky with battery industry, I think, because the more I learned about the science and the, and the industry, the more I wanted to learn. And it feels like a space of endless innovation, really. Um, we read the news, you listen to podcasts, publications, every media source really is telling you about new advances in, in battery science. And, and yeah, it's just a, it's a fascinating time to be involved, basically. So um, what got me back into academia um, through UCL? Uh, it's a good question, really. It was a hard decision to make. And this time I actually took a long time weighing up my decisions. But essentially, it came down to I find a career that I wanted to be in for a long time, um, regardless of company, although I did love my time at Anafite. Um, so um, for that long career, I wanted a strong foundation to build from. And I felt the skills, experience and network that a PhD offers gave me that foundation in abundance. Um, as well as an opportunity to study um, the subject in, in real depth, which is f finally a subject I was quite excited about. Um, and then it was about project, supervisor, location and funding. So it had to be a, a good mix of all of those to pull me away from where I was. So I spent a long time on uh, findaphd.com, meeting different supervisors and groups until I've found the one that I'm in now. And uh, essentially I work on um, I work on the CatMap project actually with the Faraday Institution, but that basically means I'm, I'm trying to discover and optimize new high nickel cathode materials for lithium ion batteries using a tunable and scalable method. Um, the method is CHFS, continuous hydrothermal flow synthesis. I'll let you guys look at that if you want to, but basically it's, um, there's a kind of image shown on the, on the slide there of, of what it looks like in real life and what it looks like as the process is actually happening. Um, but essentially I'm working on cathodes because they are the limiting component of the battery. So if you improve the cathode, you tend to improve the battery. And if you can do that in a more sustainable um, green method, such as CHFS, then you're adding, you're adding more benefits there as well. Um, so what does life look like in academia? Um, so it's not all about the research, although that is very important. Um, for me personally, this is some of the things that are involved in my day. So I'll always cycle to university. Um, you might hear a lot of bad things about cycling through London, but I personally think it's good fun. But uh, with the caveat that your bike actually works. So that's just a photo of me having some regular bike trouble there. Um, then when I'm in university, having a coffee, catching up with the PhDs in my group, catching up with emails. And then you'll basically be planning your day or going over data from the previous week or or getting in the lab and actually getting getting the data um, from, from your research. So these are just some um, images taken of some of the steps involved in the battery making process. It's quite a long process from start to finish, especially when you're making the cathode materials all the way to testing the battery. So a lot, a lot of steps in between. So it's a lot of um, a lot of fun, keeps you on your toes. And then um, something that we do here at UCL, we have a, a run club um, for chemistry PhDs. So we'll do that around Regent's Park, which is just um, a large park near UCL. And then um, in the evenings uh, with our research group, we we there's a few members of our group who um, 
know the London food scene a bit better than myself as I've only just joined. But uh, once a month, we'll try and go out and try to go to a new restaurant and see see what's out there. So essentially, it's not all about the research. There's um, there's a lot going on with a um, a battery ba- life in the battery research. Um, so opportunities through the Faraday Institution. <laughs> As I mentioned before, a large part of the attra- attraction to get me back into academia was actually this training course that the Faraday Institution offer. Um, it's a fantastic, fantastic opportunity, basically. Um, you get to meet with different battery researchers, PhD researchers from across the country in high quality training. Um, you get lectures, workshops, um, even industrial site visits. And I've not done this yet, but we will be doing some STEM ambassador training to um, go into schools and, and help younger generation learn about science and batteries and, and those sort of things. Um, so on the images on the on the screen here, on the left-hand side, that was our trip to Oxford. Um, that was our initial training. Um, we got to meet the rest of the cohort, um, do some team building things. And we also got to go to WAE, um, an industrial site visit, and see what those guys were up to. And then I think it was a month later, we went to Newcastle. Um, again, more amazing lectures, training, and we actually got to go to the Nissan Nissan plant and see see how um, the electric vehicles are made there. So that was pretty amazing. Um, but I'm sure the other speakers who who are on today will let you guys know a little bit more about that side of things, as I'm relatively new to it. But um, as well as the training that you get, um, the Faraday team really make a big effort to make it feel like a very tight knit cohort. So um, there's plenty of time for fun in the evenings after the training. Um, right. So yeah, ne- nearing the end now, um, any advice I can give, um, about my experience, this is, this is basically it. Um, first thing is don't, don't panic. There might be friends you have who know exactly what they want to do after the undergraduate degree. They might've had it planned for years and you might not, but, um, everyone's got their own timeline. So I don't get stressed by that too much is, is what I would say. Um, but with that in mind, you, you might want to try different roles, look for, and then look for the skills that you want. So, the first job that you do might not be the one you do forever. Forever, um, What I would advise is try and gain the skills that you want, gain the experiences that you want and make the connections with the people that you, with you, the people that you want. And then um, I think you'll start realizing what you want to do on the way more long term. So just feel free to try, try different things out um, as you're just starting. Um, I think reach out to people in, in the area that you're going to work in. That's a really big one. Don't be scared to send a LinkedIn message or an email often people want to want to help and want to let you know about their experiences. Um, from my personal experience, I find that the information that you get from messaging people directly um, is, is the best source of information, really, because it tends to come unfiltered and you get a, a very good feel for what it's like working in that industry or, or working in that, in that, in that, um, for that company or in that, in that profession. Um, and then finally, take the opportunities available to you at your university. Uh, one thing that's very hard to match, I think, in the working world is the amount that you have at your fingertips at university. So endless collaboration, endless extra opportunities. Um, if there's an email that goes out about um, a chance to work abroad or the chance to help on a poster or a project or, or the chance to go to a conference, I'd recommend that you um, you take the plunge and you, and you go for it because I, I promise it'll, it'll be worth it. And and even if you don't like it, at least, you, at least you've learned that. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, and I think that is essentially all I've got to say today. So thanks for listening and uh, feel free to ask any questions to me on the forum. Um, I think we'll run through those at the end, as Izzy mentioned. And um, yeah, and if you want to message me on LinkedIn, feel free to do that as well. Um, but thank you. Over to you, Izzy. Thank you very much, Callum. So our next speaker is Halima from Birmingham. Hi everyone. Um, so thank you so much for the introduction, Izzy. So I'm Halima. I'm a Faraday PhD researcher who's currently in my last year of PhDing. And I'm at the University of Birmingham working on the next road project of the Faraday Institution in the Energy Materials Group led by Professor Kendro. So today I'm just going to talk about my PhD journey so far and what the future could hold for me. So in terms of my academic journey, it started here at this university where I did chemistry for my undergrad and I really enjoyed the subject that I was studying. So the plan was that after PhD, I was going to go straight into PhD, 
Um, the plan was after my undergrad, I was going to go into my PhD, but that didn't exactly go to plan. So I ended up working in industry in polymer chemistry for a construction material manufacturer. I was still grateful for my year with them as I learned so much more skills about coatings, which are now applied to my electric coatings. And I got to see the commercial and technical aspect of my role. But then the pandemic hit and it put things into perspective. And I realized that I missed university, but more so I wanted to work in the battery industry. So I, I then applied for PhDs again in the battery sector, but more importantly, I wanted to stay at the University of Birmingham. So I was fortunate enough to be offered a Faraday PhD position on, as part of the next year project in the Kendrick Group, and that's where I am today. So my inspiration for doing a PhD, um, and the main reason came from being in your position right now. So during my undergrad, I undertook a summer research placement in one of the groups in the School of Chemistry, and I had first-hand experience of working with other PhD students and postdocs. And I saw that during my placement and during my master's research project, how much I enjoyed being in control of my own work and creating experiments to see good results. And I knew that I wanted to do a PhD after my summer placement, but I just needed to find the right topic. So during my final year of university, uh, in one of our inorganic chemistry modules, there was a battery topic that was delivered by Dr. Phoebe Allen, who's very much involved in the Faraday projects. And that was one of my favorite courses throughout the whole of my undergrad degree. So I knew after doing this topic that I wanted to pursue a PhD in battery technology and try and help com combat the environmental crisis. So a little bit about my PhD project. So we know that we need to use the stop, stop the use of fossil fuels as we move towards net zero. So there's been a use of lithium for rechargeable energy storages. However, lithium is now deemed as a critical material. So we need to look at other elemental materials such as sodium, which is cheaper and abundant. So in my project, I'm using the sodium material called Prussian White to overcome the sustainability limits of lithium. But tying this in with the other half of my project where I'm looking at manufacturing of electrodes. So currently in industry, when we get our electrode coating, they're usually flat to damage your electrodes as shown here. But if we want a cell that has both high energy and high power, we can increase the energy by increasing the thickness of electrodes as shown by this red arrow. But do doing this elongates the ionic pathways. So to overcome this, we can introduce a 3D structure within our electrodes as such. And then when we increase the thickness of these 3D structured electrodes, we still maintain our short ionic pathways that we want. So one way to do this is by using a 3D printer and you can print out 3D stretch electrodes as such here. So this has been done in literature before and other researchers have managed to coat up to 1500 microns thick electrodes. So this is my 3D printer in action. So you can see the electrode ink that's loaded up into this chamber here. Pressure is applied from the top and our electrode ink is extruded through nozzles as such. And you can print all sorts of patterns as you can see in the middle image here. So a typical day as a PhD researcher is a mix of lab and office work, but it's very much spread over a week. So I usually start off my day going through my plan for the week and start off by doing a little bit of emails and admin. And then I go into the lab, make up my electrodes. And then once they're dry, I can assemble cells in the glove box as my sodium material is very sensitive. And then once my cells are made, I usually put these on tests. And once I get the data, start analyzing this. I can also do a lot of imaging with my electrodes. So I use the SEM and Leica for this. And then the other half of my work is actually a lot of sitting at my desk, analyzing all the data that I've got and prep for meetings. But it's also not all work with a PhD, as our group is quite big. So there's about 35 members at the moment. So we do a lot of group social events, as you can see. And this is one of our postdocs when he left. But no day is the same, though, because as part of the Faraday Institution, you also have a lot of opportunities to go for training and network and industry visits. So we've had trips to Oxford to see the Harwell Science Campus. So we've seen the Faraday Institution headquarters and nas national facilities such as Diamond and ISIS in Oxford. We've also had a week in Newcastle. So we've seen how the battery and manufacturing plants up north are. And we've also had presenter training from Body Dog. But one of my favorite courses was the MBA course that was delivered by Imperial, where we had to come up with a business idea. And then at the end of the week, we got to pitch this business idea to industry experts. Other courses that we've had on the Faraday Institution is um, the WMG Bachelor School and even STEM ambassador training. We've had a chance to present to school children. 
So this final year of training has had a strong focus towards careers. So we've had CV workshops and mock interviews to get us ready for the outside world. And that's helped me immensely for deciding what to do after PhD and how to make myself stand out from the crowd. But not only are the Faraday Institution PhD training events useful, we're also building relationships with other PhD students at different universities and projects. And you get to share your same experiences with them or even collaborate with them on some research ideas. So I've definitely made some close friendships with these students in my cohort, and it's been really nice to have their support here too. So further to the Faraday, Faraday Institution training programme, you also have access to a training budget and this can be used on activities to build your PhD journey. So I've had the opportunity to attend conferences in the UK and internationally, but one of the highlights of my career so far was presenting at the Faraday Institution Conference last year in Birmingham to an audience of 500 delegates. So I enjoyed showcasing my research to the community, but more so after I presented, I had the opportunity to have meaningful discussions with other researchers who gave me an idea of what I could do with my data further. Um, with my PhD as well, I've had the chance to run experiments at Diamond to get some um, XRD and in situ tomography of my batteries whilst they're cycling. And taken on from the MBA training that we had at Imperial, I went on to do an online MBA course with LSE, and that gave me a taste of what a real MBA would entail in the future. And I got to connect with other professionals in different industries. But one of the main highlights of my PhD so far is that I've had the exposure to industry. So one of my PhD colleagues, who was in the first cohort of the Faraday Institution, um, created his own startup called About Energy with another PhD researcher called Gavin, and they started commercializing their research ideas. So I had the opportunity to work with his lab team and start doing teardowns of batteries, which is completely opposite of what I do, which is making batteries. But this further extended my battery skills and I learned a bit more about battery electrochemistry. And there's a chance as well that um, in the past couple of months, I've got to complete a three month internship with another startup called Boil Power, who focus on battery management systems. And this manages and monitors the battery, which is vital to ensure that we get a good battery overall. So from this internship, I had a chance to learn programming with Python and how to conduct data analysis, and also a little bit more about battery modeling. Again, completely different to my PhD, but it opened my eyes to what roles are available in the industry and figure out what I am suited to. So one of the main things that I've taken away from my industry experience is that how valuable it is to build your professional network and seeing how our industry works has given me an insight of where I could take my future career. These experiences have helped me see that I'm more suited to an industrial role rather than academia, but more so being part of the Faraday Institution and being part of the Next Trade Project, which is very much manufacturing focus and connected to um, industrial partners. I've had the chance to build contacts within the Next Trade um, Network, which again has helped me. And with the help of the Faraday Training Budget, I've had a taste of what, how doing an MBA could also further my career in the future. So lastly, for all you guys who are thinking of doing a PhD, I would highly recommend doing a research-based internship during undergrad. So the Faraday Institution also offers FUSE internships during the summer. So that will give you a taste of what to expect whilst you're PhDing. But more so when it comes to finding a PhD position, it's important to find a project that you will enjoy as you're going to be spending four years researching that topic. And a big part of your PhD is going to be down to your supervisor and the university that you're based. So when it comes to researching, definitely meet your potential supervisor and the group and see how you would get on with them. So I'm quite lucky as the Energy Materials Group, we are very friendly and we all do help each other with our work. And more so having Emma as my supervisor, I do look up to her and she's very much my mentor and inspiration. Another big thing to think about is also your funding body. So I'm grateful to have a Faraday funded PhD as I've had so much more opportunities to build my career outside of research. And more so I had an exposure to all these battery companies that in turn could be my future employer. And another common misconception is that PhD probably will take up all of your time, but I think if you have a good time skill management set and create boundaries between your work and life um, that's definitely important to maintain so my last key advice is to enjoy the PhD and the opportunities you get whilst PhDing as you create your own project and trust me the four years will definitely go really fast so I'd just like to say thank you to the Energy Materials Group and of course to my supervisors Emma Kendrick and Carl Reynolds and to Boyle Power and About Energy for giving me the opportunity to work with them 
and of course to the Faraday Institution for funding my PhD. Thank you so much for listening. If you've got any questions, feel free to email me or connect with me on LinkedIn. Thanks. Thank you so much, Halima. Um, great to hear from both Halima and Callum so far. Now we have Daisy from Brimac. Hello, everybody. Let me just share my screen. There we go. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Izzy. Um, so my name is Daisy and I work at Rimats Energy. And before I dive into some more details about what I'm doing at Rimats, um, I thought I might go through my path up until now. So I grew up in Geneva in Switzerland um, and I moved to London for my undergrad. Um, so I went to University College London and I did a master's in chemical physics. And in our final year, we had the opportunity to choose a project for our master's project. And it felt really important to me to try to apply um, some of the skills that I'd acquired over the last few years to work on something that I'm passionate about, which was trying to help to tackle climate change. So I chose a project in the green chemistry group um, at UCL and uh, my project ended up being about magnesium ion batteries. So, um, throughout this project, I got my first chance at uh, hands-on battery research. And um, yeah, so you can see on the right there, I'm making some coin cells, um, which are the little batteries that you sometimes find in a watch, for example. Um, and when I went into my undergrad, I really didn't think that I would be interested in doing a PhD. But at the end of this project, I had fallen in love with the battery science and um, I had many more questions that I wanted to keep exploring. So I um, looked for a, for a PhD project that was looking into batteries. Um, and I found this project at Imperial College London in the materials department. And um, yeah, with the Faraday Institution. So I was working in the Faraday Institution degradation project. And in this project, researchers all over the UK are um, studying different uh, degradation mechanisms that take place inside lithium ion batteries. Um, and they're studying them with all different kinds of techniques. So I was studying um, the uh, gases that are formed as side reactions um, inside the a lithium ion battery. And then we were sharing all of our results together and coming up with a holistic understanding of degradation in lithium ion batteries. And this understanding will ultimately help us to build better batteries that last longer. So I think the thing that I love the most about doing my PhD was the variety in the work. Um, as the others have mentioned, I think there's a lot of time working in the lab, um, learning hands-on skills. Um, there's also lots of time reading and writing, presenting, traveling to conferences. Um, I also had a lot of opportunities that I kind of dived into. So um, I got some experience project man with project management when I um, built a few battery research labs. Um, I learned a lot about intellectual property when we filed for a, uh, we filed a patent application for some of the work from my research. Um, and I loved learning from all of my colleagues. There was an amazing atmosphere um, and it was really exciting to be all working together on something. Um, and I think, again, as the others have highlighted, I think it's really key to point out that the Faraday Institution training program was a great experience. Um, I learned a lot, but there were many different professional development courses. Um, we had yeah, STEM ambassador training, which um, was really exciting. And we got lots of opportunities to speak with different generations and learn about how to communicate um, science to a wide variety of audiences. Um, and again, the community that the Faraday Institution has built up and the network has been amazing. Um, I think for me, what I've found really valuable about it is that it allowed me to contextualize my research. Um, I think when you're doing a PhD, it's easy to sort of get tunnel vision and just focus on your particular area of your research. But the Faraday Institution really allows you to see the bigger picture and see how your work fits into it all. So that was my PhD. And 
although I loved my PhD, at the end of um, at the end of the PhD, I was keen to try something new. Um, so I decided to move to industry and started working at Remat Energy. I just wanted to point out as well that although this was my path to working in the battery industry, I don't think by any means that it's necessary to um, have a PhD. It's not a requirement to working in the battery industry. This was just um, my path. So Rimats is well known for their hypercar, the Nevera, um, which is a really innovative and high-performing hypercar. Um, it recently set a bunch of world records that you can see here. Um, and I think this is a really great example of how uh, clever engineering can lead to really high performance uh, where we're making the most out of the lithium ion batteries in the electric hypercar. So Rimats Energy, which is where I work, um, is a sub or it's a business unit within the Rimats group where um, we're taking the innovation and the engineering know-how that has been applied to building the um, really high performing electric hypercar. And we're applying that to push the boundaries and create a very technologically advanced battery energy storage system. So these types of batteries are the types of batteries that can store energy from the sun and from the wind um, so that we have access to energy when renewable um, supply is lower. So at night, for example. Um, but they're also the kinds of batteries that can be used to help to stabilize um, and decarbonize our electricity grids. So these kinds of systems, um, these energy storage systems are vital for a clean and resilient energy supply and are a really key factor for helping us to reach our uh, net zero targets. So here at the bottom, you can see our product. This is the Rimat sign stack, we call it. Um, and yeah, so I'm now working as a cell degradation engineer in the advanced battery software team. So I moved away from working in the lab and now I am developing advanced state of health optimization algorithms um, to try to extend the battery lifetimes and to really help our customers get the most out of the battery data that they have through software. Um, in terms of what a day in the life is like, I think I have to say that no day is really the same. Um, it's a slightly faster pace than academia, which takes a bit of getting used to, but I think it's really great because um, it gave me it gives me a lot of exposure to a lot of different projects, which ultimately means I have lots of opportunities to learn. And then I think similarly to what I loved about doing my PhD, um, I really love the variety of the work that I have here as well. So um, I feel like I'm always learning something new and there's um, a really big group of talented engineers and scientists with a wealth of knowledge to learn from. Um, and along that line, I think it's really exciting to work together um, and we're all passionate about this project um, that will hopefully have a big impact and will help us to reach, reach our net zero targets. Here are a few photos of the Rimats team. Um, and thank you, looking forward to answering some questions. Thank you very much, Daisy. That was really, really cool to hear um, from industry there. Um, so finally, we have a small talk from Dom at the Faraday Institution. Hello, uh, lovely to see so many people uh, online. Um, I'm Dom Grantley-Smith, um, and I'm just going to give you a quick overview of uh, some of the things that you can do post this talk um, to talk about kind of opportunities um, uh, with linked to PhDs. Um, so uh, yeah, as I said, I'm Don Grant Smith. I'm work at the Faraday uh, Institution HQ. Um, and if you do want to follow up with any questions post this, please do uh, drop me an email uh, or connect with me on LinkedIn. I've put the information in the chat. Uh, so um, following on from this, uh, we run uh, Faraday Undergrad Summer Experiences, or FUSE as we like to call it. Um, these are internships for undergrad uh, students, uh, which will allow you to take part in an eight-week summer placement. Uh, so they typically happen uh, around uh, June um, and last for about eight weeks. And we do this with all our partnered universities. So you'll get some real-life experience in labs 
and working with academics as well. And we have up to 55 projects to apply for this year. Um, the idea of all this is to give you the opportunity of lab experience and give you a real feel of what the kind of battery sector is like, uh, including the energy storage sector as well. And you, know, you get to work on a project um, where you'll do some real research and produce a poster at the end of this. And you'll also connect, as we have mentioned, with uh, some role models across the industry. Um, if you want to find out more, if you go onto our website, um, we'll uh, share these links after. Um, but we have a whole Fuse page and you can read about the testimonies from last year um, and uh, we'll be launching mid-March uh, all the projects that you can apply for and where they'll be as well. Um, we had someone last year, as you can see on the right-hand side of our screen, a city, and she sat where you were this year, um, or sat in Fuse 23 on the Battery Day Talk uh, and then applied to a Fuse internship at About Energy one of our spin-out companies and, uh, uh, and now wants to go and work in the battery sector. So it's a really good low risk way of finding out um, whether you'd like to do a PhD um, or explore this area as a sector post university. Uh, if you are interested in doing a PhD, um, my first protocol would say I'd encourage you to go and look at findaphd.com. Um, there are currently 91 projects globally linked to the battery sector. But we have highlighted some here in Birmingham and St Andrews, so we do have many across the UK as well. Um, we also try and highlight as many of our, um, our opportunities uh, linked to the energy sector on our website as well. So please do uh, go and have a look there. Um, a lot of our speakers have uh, talked about how wonderful our training PhD training programme is as well. Um, so once you do have a confirmed PhD, um, you can then apply for our training programme and be part of cohort seven. Um, this is where you'll get receive about additional £10,000 of training a year. Um, and they include trips, as they've mentioned, to Newcastle and uh, to battery schools um, and industry visits as well. Um, so this will be launching around the 18th of March. And if you follow our LinkedIn um, or the Faraday Institution, um, we will be trying to highlight that as well. Um, and uh, it's, it's open for anyone um, in the UK PhD uh, in the first year of their uh, battery uh, PhD as such. So I just um, uh, uh, want to say thank you for all of you joining. It's no nice to meet uh, you all. And uh, if you do have any questions, do do use this opportunity to get in touch and you're more than welcome to follow us on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, yes, do join into the battery sector. It's a fast growing area um, that, uh, yeah, I hope you've heard from people today. It's really can be an inspiring place. Back to you, Izzy. Thank you very much, Dom. Um, so we're going to kick off a Q&A for about 20 minutes now. Um, so I'm going to start by asking a question myself. And then if you'd like to ask any questions, please put them in the Q&A box, not in the chat box. And then we'll be able to answer them. Um, so I'm going to start by asking all of you, what advice would you give yourself if you were an undergraduate watching this talk? So um, Callum, you've sort of touched on this a little bit. So I'm going to start with you. If that's well, um, yeah, I gave a few on my slides, but I guess yeah, the biggest one, well, it was first, don't, don't panic and um, don't don't worry too much if your friends have got um, paths lined up. Just just look out there, see what's available. As, as Dom's just shown there, there's many opportunities through Faraday, um, through batteries. Just just take a look out there, basically. And, and, and if you don't know exactly what to do yet, taking those experiences and trying things out will will feed feed what you want to do in the future so yeah don't panic nice thank you um Halima what do you think well I think my advice would be to go into a career that you know you'll enjoy because you're going to spend most of your life working so just make sure it's something that you're going to enjoy thank you and um, what about you Daisy yeah, I think um, touching on what Callum said as well, I think taking some time to reflect a little bit on what's important to you, um, what did you enjoy, what are you enjoying, and then um, you've got so many opportunities ahead that you can jump into, and um, yeah, I think take make the most of the opportunities that you have around you, and then um, take some time to figure out what you want to do next and, and go for it. Thanks. Um, Cool. Okay, so we've got some questions in the chat that I'm going to come to now. In the uh, sorry, in the Q and A box that I'm going to come to now. Um, so I'm going to start with Tom's question, which is: Do you all 
think you'll be in the battery industry post PhD. So um, could I start with you, Daisy, because you've already left your PhD. So looking back, did you always think you'd stay in the battery industry? So I think, um, I mean, like I said, I didn't think I was going to do a PhD when I started my undergrad. Um, and yeah, I just kind of fell in love with the battery science. And when I was doing my PhD, um, yeah, really enjoyed the science of it, but also the community. And I think batteries are going to play a more and more important role in our futures. And I think it's a really amazing place to be where we can try to have real impact. Thanks. Um, what about you, Halima? What do you think of post-PhD? Um, so post-PhD, most likely, well, 100% chance I am going to go into industry, um, ideally for battery manufacturer, because that's what my PhD is focused on and I really do enjoy it so going into the lab making batteries put them, putting them on test and then seeing how well they work that's something that I really do enjoy and that's where I am in terms of now so starting to apply for jobs in manufacturer from manufacturers at the moment yeah what about you Callum yeah 100% uh, I think um yeah it's um as I was saying before doing my undergrad I saw a lot of different areas of chemistry, nothing really stuck. And then once I found that uh, career path through and I fight through that, through that startup and started to realize how big the world of uh, the battery industry is and the science. And it, it's just, yeah, there's just so many opportunities and um, yeah, I love doing it basically. So uh, yeah, definitely. Nice. Thank you all for your thoughts on that one. Um, I've got a specific question for you here, Halima from Georgia. Um, does, 3D printing have to be conducted in a glove box due to the sensitivity of the materials you work with, or is it bench bench top stable? Yeah. So one thing I didn't mention is the electrode inks that I'm using, they're water-based. So I can do this 3D printing by open air and it's completely fine. The only problem is when it comes to the push and what you just need to make sure that it's dry properly, because if there's still interstitial water bonded in, it's not great for the electrochemistry. So that's one of the big learning lessons that I've had. Nice. Thank you, Halima. Um, also, some specific questions for you, Daisy, if that's all right, about RIMAC. Do you have any tips for getting a job at RIMAC or working there? Um, yeah, I guess. So probably there are a lot of internships that Remats does. So I think keep an eye out on their website, um, keep an eye out on their careers pages. Um, I would say have a think again about what it is specifically that you want to do there. I think Remats is always looking for really passionate people who um, want to work hard to try to get these products out and who can be really innovative and work well together in a team. So um, yeah, have a look, have a look online and um, <laughs> nice thank you that's good um there's a question here that says i would like to know what the most important research skills are in battery research and how do we acquire it that's quite a broad question actually um callum would you like to go first yeah that is a that is a good question that's a that is quite a broad one um i don't think i could pick one particular um skill uh, specifically but um I think it's important to be able to look at the, from my experience, look at the the nitty gritty, small scale science and phenomena as what's happening, and then be able to take a step back and look at the big picture of what's happening and how that applies downstream. Because it's such a, like I was saying before, it's such a huge start to end of the, like the, you can even start the mining of it to all the way through to recycling. It's such a large process that you need to be able to, yeah, hone in on the specifics, but also step back and look at the the wider picture as well and how it impacts each side of the, of the of the product chain basically um is one but there's a lot there's lots of things that are important i would say going to be um going to be willing to accept a bit of failure as well i think um and just be committed to it yeah, a bit i'd say tenacity you want to keep keep working on it and get in the lab and get get the good results so yeah that's a very good point um halima do you have any thoughts on the most important skill for a researcher i think there's a lot of skills that you start off with but then you end up building on them but I think the main one is probably time management because you're in charge of your own work essentially and you have to go back to your supervisor and show the data and 
at the end of the day, you still want to produce a thesis and you want something that's quite novel. But I think time management is like the big skill, like to stay on top of it all, which very much in your last year, it feels a bit stressful. Yes. <laughs> um, Daisy, have you answered this question? <laughs> no, sorry, uh, just reading the other questions. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, so I think, I guess a kind of a combination of what um, Callum and Halima said, I think it's really important to um, sort of be able to pick out an area of um, within the battery literature that is kind of missing some research and finding your um, way that you can contribute to the literature or to the to the field. Um, I think that's quite a, a valuable and quite a tricky skill actually sometimes to be able to pinpoint what it is that you're doing that's different and um, what it is that you're doing that will help to develop the, the field. Um, and I think also being able to communicate your science well. Um, if, if you're the only person who understands what you're doing, then it's not really going to help to uh, move the field forward. So I think being able to communicate it well, whether that's in a paper or a conference or to school children as well, it's, um, it's a really valuable skill to develop. Very good point. And a lot of our Faraday training does center around that science communication. Um, so yeah, very good point there. Um, a couple of the questions touch on this kind of theme. So um, all of us obviously have done PhDs, but what other ways are there of getting into the battery industry without one? And are there any you would recommend? I'm going to start with you, Halima, because you, well, you and Callum have both worked in industry first and then come back to a PhD. So if I start with you. Um, so I'd reach out to companies who work in the battery industry and um, what roles that they offer, because not necessarily all roles do you need a PhD for. So you could build your experience through there. And a lot of companies are hiring at the moment, so. Yeah, and um, Callum, what would you say? Because you actually did start um, in, a PhD, in a battery company without a PhD. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, my, my experience was um, actually a kind of situational one. It was, as I mentioned, it was kind of speaking to people in that uh, incubator hub. So it was a, it was a kind of like, e ecosystem of different scientists working together and and that was just uh, a situation that came up through through speaking to a friend and and that was I guess quite specific but I guess you can take that example to a large scale so you can make that ecosystem bigger by connecting with people uh, through LinkedIn or on other platforms and just um, reaching out to them and you never know opportunities are going to be available to you really unless unless you reach out but I think if you've got a degree behind you in a, in a rel related um, technology related um, area sorry you're gonna that comes with a lot more weight than I think you might realize especially if you're the type of person to actually message them independently that I think that goes quite a long way as well if you're that if you're looking for that opportunity that goes a lot further than you think yeah completely and so Daisy you work with people who don't necessarily have a PhD so what would you say about getting into the industry without one yeah there's people with all kinds of different backgrounds um, and all kinds of different paths that have led them to this position that we're in. Um, and yeah, I, get, I think it's just the passion and the motivation for project, um, being interested obviously in batteries and being motivated about what they mean for us. Um, I think that's really valuable. Um, and I guess, yeah, tips for looking for a position if you don't want to do a PhD is probably just LinkedIn, link, turn on the notifications, look at all of the job um, descriptions and get an idea of what different companies are looking for and see if you can build your skills around that as well. Yes, thank you. Um, so one last question for all three of you, and that's from James, and that's, are there any resources that the panelists found particularly useful in the early years of their undergraduate degrees? So I'm gonna start with you, Callum, this time. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I can see you thinking. <laughs> um, ooh, um, well, during my, well, if it was specific to battery science, I, I actually didn't know that I was going to do that. But in, in, in general, resources that I think helped me uh, moving forward was um, one example was a, a lecturer actually just sent out an email saying there's an opportunity to work abroad in Prague for a little while. He had a friend who had a, an opportunity there and um, I actually tapped into that and got some good experience working, working abroad for a little bit. So I guess you could say that those resources that you have in your community at your 
um, university are the ones you should be tapping into. So those sort of collaboration opportunities that lecturers might have, I found that useful because then the skills I learned working there transferred to um, other jobs that I took and took me to Anafite and then took me to the PhD I'm at now. So I think I think probably that. Yeah, and I um, second that as well. I found my FUSE internship by chatting to my lecturers and asking them for their advice and for other people to go and talk to. So yeah, um, the resources within your own university and your own course are super important. Um, Halima, do you have any thoughts about resources for undergrads? Yeah, so my point also uh, goes with Callum and Izzy uh, because I did that battery module during my undergrad, I had all my notes from Phoebe Allen's um, lecture course. So I used those like at the start of my PhD. And then I remember with the start of our PhD with Faraday Institution, we had that battery week, which was an intro into battery. So we had all their notes and handbooks, which I still use and I still refer back to uh, for everything. And also there's quite a lot online as well. So sometimes it's good to look at research papers that go down to the basics of electrochemistry, for example. Mm. completely agree and um finally daisy do you have any thoughts on resources um i guess yeah i guess you're in you know a university with some really talented lecturers and professors so make the most of the fact that you have access to them while you're there and learn the most that you can from them i think um other resources or your own notes, I guess, at the end of the day. I still look back at all of my notes from um, university when I need a refresher on some of the, the theory behind things. Um, and and I guess your colleagues as well, you've got um, all, of the uh, all of the students that you're studying with and make the most of the support you can give each other. Yeah, thank you so much. So thank you three for very, um, insightful comments to all of our questions and I'm going to finish with one final question which is for Dom and the Faraday Institution which is from Emily and it asks how can I apply for a summer internship in the Faraday Institution? Uh, great question so uh, currently we are just collecting all the uh, proposals for projects uh, for FUSE interns over the summer um, but uh, around the middle of March we will uh, launch the programme um, by that, if you go onto our website and you go on careers development, and then you'll see a tab that says undergrads and then FUSE, which stands for Faraday Undergrad Summer Experiences, there'll be a list um, of all the different projects that you can apply for. And it's like applying for a job. So you'll be able to um, click on there, write an application, and then uh, that'll be followed up by an interview. Um, and then from there, um, if you're successful in that application, you'll be able to get a uh, eight week placement over the summer. Um, at where that uh, placement is taking place. Um, you're welcome to apply for it if you're in your first or, or second year um, and third year if you are doing an integrated master's. Um, so you cannot apply for it if you're in the final summer of your degree. Um, so yes, it's first, second or third if you're doing an integrated master's um, as well. Um, but yes, please do apply. Um, they're great um, activities and it gives you some real life experience uh, in the lab and hopefully it'll be enough to sway you to have a career in the battery sector. Nice. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And particular thanks to our panellists today, Daisy, Halima and Callum. I hope everyone's um, enjoyed today. I certainly have. And it's been fantastic to chat to you all. And yeah, good luck, everyone, to what you decide to do next. And I hope it's in batteries. <laughs>